welcome back. And this is my PDP 1123 plus. This is the system that I'm trying to build out into a portable PDP 11 so I can take it to events. In the previous episode, it definitely gave us a proper runaround. The power supply threw me for a massive loop and took a while to get up and going, but we got the power supply working correctly. We got the 1123 CPU card in and memory card in, and it's on an 18-bit four slot backplane. So we have a working 1123 with 256K of RAM. We are pretty much set and ready to go for a portable PDP-11, except we gotta figure out something about the drives. Uh, initially, the 1123 or 1103 or any of those were meant to be used with big boys like the RL01 and RL02. These are like 14 inch hard drives weighing well over 100 pounds and that's just not gonna work for a portable system. So instead, I'm gonna try and get something like this uh, eight inch NEC half height floppy drive working. And I have a controller card that should work with this and should be compatible with the 1123. But I'd also like to have a hard drive in it. So I would like to get something like this ST225. This is a Seagate drive and I think it's like uh, 20 megabytes or maybe 30 megabytes or something like that. Pretty small drive, but it's a half height five and a quarter inch drive. So it's nice and compact pretty lightweight and it would be awesome to use that with this. Now, I don't think the original bootstrap ROM will support anything that this can be used with. I do have some controller cards, but I'm not sure if even they will support the ST225. So we're gonna have to get really pretty inventive and clever to try and get that to work. But all of this will essentially make a, a portable PDP-11. It's not tiny, but it's not huge. And I think that's gonna work perfectly. Although this is only half of the equation because you can build up the coolest, smallest, most compact PDP-11 computer, but it's completely useless unless you have some way to interact with it. For that, you need a data terminal. And up to now, I've been using my very awesome ADM3A, but that terminal is not well suited to travel. So if I try to take that around the country with me, it's gonna break. So what I need is a portable data terminal. And uh, well, when I was down in Houston to pick up the big data 620 computer over here, uh, Godfrey being the absolute legend that he is, had a couple data terminals that fit the bill perfectly. And uh, let me take one of those home. And that is, Oh, this guy right here. This is an ads envoy. And as it sits right here, it's uh, just an ugly brown box. But let me open up the front here and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> Look at that. It is absolutely stunning. It's the perfect concoction of 1970s colors, and I absolutely adore this machine. So what we're gonna do today is try and get this machine going. If, uh, well, I maybe, I have absolutely no idea how far we're going to get on it. I've never even seen the inside of one of these. So today might just be an exploratory episode, or we might plug it in and try to throw some electrons at something. I have no clue, but uh, really there's only one way to find out, and that's to dig in deeper and see what's going on. So let's just hop to it. Now, Godfrey didn't just have one of these, he had two, but the, the other one is missing its keyboard, so uh, it's relegated as a parts machine. But uh, you can see it's a fairly simple data terminal. The ads envoy here, I think, is capable of only 110 or 300 baud, so it's a miserably slow data terminal. And the CRT over here is absolutely tiny, so using this is going to be horrific, and I absolutely cannot wait. I am in love with it. I think it's absolutely fantastic. The keyboard is a wonderful shade of orange with uh, the special characters over here in yellow. And uh, well, the front panel here has not a whole lot going on. You've got a roll, uh, auto line feed, and full duplex options. These would normally be covered by dip switches, but they're right up on the front and very sticky. Uh, you have power here. And then you have uh, contrast and brightness. Both of those pots feel completely frozen solid. But that's pretty much all there is to see on the front. Uh, if we move it around to the side here, we have a little door that has something interesting hiding behind it. Since data terminals themselves are not computers, they're just a uh, essentially monitor and keyboard that can connect to a large scale system. Uh, it didn't really make sense to have a portable data terminal unless it had some way to remotely connect to a large scale system. And that's what's hiding out behind this door right here. 
First and foremost, we have an acoustic coupler. You would plug a telephone into this and that was your remote connection to your large scale system. But if that was your only option, it would be quite limited. So we actually have an RS-232 port right here as well. This is what we're going to make use of to connect to our 1123. We have a switch here that says uh, modem underneath it. I have no clue what that does. We have a little RCA jack down here that says printer. And then we have a uh, little switch up here that'll let us select between Whoa, a bunch more baud rates than I was expecting. Uh, looks like this thing goes all the way up to 9600. We've got 110, 300, 1200, 2400, and 9600. So this is going to be a lot less miserable to use than I was expecting. That's awesome. That's really exciting. I'm Wow, that's that's great. Uh, okay, so this is going to be quite a good uh, portable data terminal. Uh, well, let's uh, close this door up right quick and spin it around to the back side here and take a look at what's behind this back cover. I actually have uh, no idea what's behind here, but I'm guessing the power cord and uh, boy, oh, that's crusty with lots of probably rat poop. That's very gross. Uh, but yes, we can see our uh, power cable right over here. We can also get a uh, view of some of the main boards. We got one right here and it looks like there's one right above it. And then we have a strange coax connection over here on the far left. No clue what that's for, but man, this thing is gross. We got to get it very far apart so I can get it very clean before I go any further on this build. And I think I'm going to put on some rubber gloves to do that. <laughs> Whew, that's a lot of rat poop. Let's start getting this thing apart by taking the handle off. It's held on with two Allen head bolts through the rotation point. Then it just spreads apart and lifts right off. Uh, next, to get the keyboard out, first we gotta remove the trim panel, which is held on with four little screws in the corner, and then it pulls right out. And that gorgeous cherry mechanical keyboard underneath is held in with, yet again, four little screws. Then it lifts up, letting us get to the ribbon cable that's plugged into the back and carries the power and data. Uh, next, I want to see if I can get the front half of the clamshell off. There are two proper metal hinges holding it in place, each screwed down with six screws. It's a nice, robust design and shouldn't break or snap anytime soon, thankfully. With the hinges out of the way, I can then lift the front off, but the ribbon cable is still stuck in place, so it'll just hang off to the side for now. To get the main case off, there are four screws on the bottom that go through the center of the rubber feet. Then the outer case just slides right off the back. It's a pretty tight fit and it was battling me the whole way, but I eventually got it free. Next, let's get the cards out. And they're locked in place with this extra bracket on the back that screws down, holding them tightly in place. With the bracket out of the way, we can start sliding the cards out, starting with this half width one on the right side. Then the distribution board can be slid out, but weirdly it connects to the card below it instead of directly into the back plane. And the ribbon cables on the distribution board don't unplug easily it seems. So I'll just hold it out of the way while I slide the cards below it out. The top card looks to be the serial interface card. The middle card I think is the brains of the terminal. And finally this bottom most card I believe is the video generator card. With the cards out of the way, let's see if we can get the acoustic coupler free. With this thing loose, it should make cleaning easier. And now that we're far enough apart, I realized the only way to get the front panel off is to remove the ribbon cable. And they crimped the connector onto the ribbon cable after the panel was installed. So we have to break the connector loose in order to get the cable out. What a wild construction. The front panel is nearly ready to come off though, so I just gotta pop the potentiometer knobs off after loosening the locking studs on them. Then the panel is held on with six screws around the periphery. With those loose, the whole panel pulls right off. And this exposes the power supply, which we can see right here. This also allows us to remove the CRT unit. It's held in place with four screws on the bottom side. And with those four loose, it slides right out the front of the machine. And <laughs> look at that fun. This thing is this thing's covered in poop. 
This is, without a doubt, one of the worst projects I think I've ever undertaken in my life. Uh, this board, for example, I think at this point is more poop and urine uh, than anything else. And uh, just when you think you've seen all the poop you can see, guess what? More poop. Guess what? More poop. It's all poop. Oh, <laughs> it's so gross. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> Uh, if it ever comes back to life, it'll be an absolute miracle. Uh, I'm skeptical, but we have a couple of good things working for us. First of all, the keyboard here is in excellent shape and it's a cherry keyboard, so it's purely mechanical. That should work totally fine. It does have a uh, large IC on the back of it, but that's really clean. So the keyboard I'm uh, moderately confident can come up fine. These two boards also escaped the brunt of the poop. I mean, they're some down here that's looking very gross. Uh, but for the most part, they look pretty good. The pins of the ICs don't look all that corroded. These two boards are very, very rough. Uh, man, some of the ICs have very corroded pins because poop and urine is extremely corrosive. And uh, really, I think the only way to get these things clean is just to soak them in a cleaner, like maybe Simple Green, scrub them with the toothbrush, and then wash them off with the hose and let them dry out for a long time. Uh, especially for our uh, miniature CRT up here, you can just see this thing is just caked. And which makes sense, this was the most open spot in the entire chassis. So whatever rodent was living in here would have made their nest right here. Uh, you can see that the urine was so awful that it went through the zinc coated uh, frame here and it has started to corrode and rust that away. So man, we got a lot of work ahead of us and I think most of it is gonna involve the hose. To clean this thing, I'm going to spray down each board with Simple Green, then use a soft bristle brush to work the cleaner in and break loose all the poop and urine. Once it's looking relatively clean, I'll spray the board down with water and wash away all the grossness. Now, I can already hear the keyboards of a thousand angry commenters, but let me explain. First of all, Simple Green and water are gonna do far less damage than what 20 years of rodent feces has already done. Secondly, this is actually a legitimate way to clean electronics. Nearly every electronic part is very well sealed up, so a little water won't intrude and break down the silicon or electrolyte or whatever. ICs, for example, are plastic packages, and if water can get as far as the silicon, so can the humidity in the air, and that IC is already long dead. The only ones to really keep an eye on are transformers or coils. Uh, finally, I won't be putting power back into these until I'm absolutely sure they're fully dry. To ensure that, I let them air dry for a few hours, then I took them in and used compress air to blow out any water that was collecting under components. Then I let them air dry again for a full day before finally going back over the boards with a hair dryer to be absolutely sure they were dry. Everything cleaned up really well, it's not Perfect. I mean, there's still a lot of rust in places and that would require taking the thing completely apart and uh, re-zinc coating everything. So we're just gonna let it fly its rusty colors. Also, there's still uh, a faint aroma of rodent feces. The uh, CRT unit here, I'm still also a little skeptical about. It's probably in the roughest shape. Uh, the power supply over here did clean up pretty well. Uh, I am hopeful that it'll come back. The buttons here all work great now that I put a little deoxid in them. Even the uh, potentiometers are now spinning correctly as well. So uh, that's all looking good. The PCBs look almost brand new. There was uh, very little damage from the, uh, <laughs> the urine. Uh, this one up here has some solder mask that's worn away. So we may have to take a more in-depth look at that, but everything else looks like it even came back to life. Uh, this one in particular I thought was gonna be awful and it looks like the solder mask did its job. So uh, hopefully we don't need to do too much troubleshooting, but I think we need to start with the power supply. The power supply should put out plus 12, plus five and minus 12. And we have three big capacitors on the side here. I've already checked those, they're not shorted. And um, we should be able to check our voltages off of those. Um, hopefully we throw some electrons in it and we see our voltages and we're all good to go. But boy, that sure is, that sure is a lot of optimism. Uh, let's, uh, I don't know, let's 
put some power in it and see what blows up. I'm really not expecting anything to happen. I'm expecting my power switch here to not work at all, so I'm not expecting anything. But uh, if we're lucky, the 120 volt AC fan here should start blowing air out this way. It's probably gonna stink a little bit. Uh, and if we're really lucky, I've got uh, the digital multimeter, the HP 3476B that I got from uh, Philip. Thank you so much for that. I've got that sitting here and um, I've got it across this big white capacitor here. No idea which one that is, but uh, hopefully we'll see some voltage across it. So we'll go ahead and flip the breaker on here. Get myself a little bit of distance here in case it goes up in smoke. And here goes nothing. The fan's spinning. We've got plus 13.6 volts there. That's gonna be probably the plus 12 for uh, the CRT and RS-232. It's probably a little high because it's expecting a bit of a load, but that's, <laughs> that's excellent news. It, it kind of works. Let's check the other two capacitors. Maybe we've got uh, good voltage on those as well. All right, I'm on the upper blue capacitor now. It's uh, currently showing one volt. Um, it's off, so that's just uh, residual. So let's go ahead and flip the power switch here. That's 27.1 volts. That is a voltage I was not expecting to see. Maybe that's expected? <laughs> that's such a weird voltage. <laughs> I'm on the bottom blue capacitor now. You can see it's already showing 22 volts. The system's off, so that's just what that capacitor is holding. But let's flip the power switch on. And that is 31 volts. So we had uh, plus 12, plus 27, and plus 31 volts. None of that seems right, but um, I don't know, maybe this thing does need a load on it to bring those down to something that makes sense or... Uh, Boy, that sure is strange. This is probably naive and a little dumb, but uh, I'm approaching this with uh, one of two mindsets. Either it's fine, it just needed a clean, and we should troubleshoot it under the basis that 99% of it is already working, or it's thrashed. It's so bad, it's not even savable, in which case we can do no more harm. Either way, that leads me to where I am right now of plugging more stuff in and flipping the power switch on to see what happens. Uh, what I have in right now is just the CRT. None of the circuit boards are in, so we're not risking any rare ICs. Everything else is just a discrete component that I can order with the exception of the uh, transformers. All I'm trying to see is if it'll generate some high voltage. If we get high voltage on the CRT, um, maybe that's a good sign. So here we go. I'm going to flip this switch on down here, hit the power switch. That one came on. We don't have a power LED on up here. I have no idea if we're generating high voltage. I can't hear it. I'm deaf. Uh, let's crank brightness and contrast up and see if we get some image showing up on that. Well, that was anticlimactic. Let's keep plugging stuff back in. I'm just gonna go full send on this one and I'm gonna put all of the cards back in and just flip the switch and see what happens. The reason that I'm doing this is that I don't know how much of the power distribution is controlled by the cards. The power supply has all these power plugs that plug into a distribution card that then plugs into a slot on one of the main PCBs. So without the cards in there, it may never send power to the right places. So that's the condition that we have it in right now. Uh, the keyboard is in and plugged in. Oh boy, I've got the GoPro going in case something goes up in smoke. We'll flip this switch down here and then we'll flip the main power switch here. The 120 volt fan spun up. It did not beep. Our power light did not come on. Carrier light did not come on. Nothing is happening. I don't know. Let's see if we've at least got some voltage showing up on the pins. If we're seeing like 30 volts on the 7400 series chips in there, then we know we got a problem. So I've got the uh, leads to my voltmeter here on a uh, 7400. Uh, that should be power and ground. We should see five volts on that. So if we see anything other than five volts here, we know we got a problem. 4.99 volts. Okay, so the logic is probably totally fine. 4.99 volts looks really good too. So uh, 
we probably have a problem with our uh, 12 volt generation, our negative 12 volt generation, or our CRT circuit here. Um, so I'm gonna look a little closer on those. But the fact that Logic has a good five volts is excellent news. One more thing I wanna check, we're looking at the neck of the CRT here and we should be able to see the filament glow in there. If the CRT is busted or we have a voltage issue to there, the filament will be dark. So what we're looking for is a nice uh, red glow coming out of that. Flip the switch on here and yeah, there it goes. I can see the CRT glowing. That is excellent news. We've got a good filament voltage going on. Man, a lot of this is starting to come back to life. That's amazing. One more voltage check. I'm on an LM709. This is an op amp, so it should have some positive voltage and some negative voltage on it. So we're gonna give that a test and see what we see. So I'll go ahead and flip the power switch here. Negative 12 volts, that's exactly what I would have expected to see. And positive 12 volts, 12.5. It's a little high, but we have, <laughs> that's excellent news. We have good five volts, we have good plus 12, we have good minus 12, and it's all on the logic. So uh, that leads me to believe that our failure is in the CRT circuit here, which makes the most sense actually. I'm gonna jump in here right quick. I'm sitting here editing this thing up and it's like it's like Friday evening and this thing's gotta be up on Sunday. So that tells you how uh, long this video has been running. But uh, I realized that there's a pretty heavy investment in the machine up to this point in the video. And uh, from this point forward, I shift gears pretty heavily and I don't really address or say anything to assuage the fears that I've just completely forgotten about the machine that we've worked on up to this point. So I wanted to uh, essentially just say two things. Uh, the first is that sometimes this is how repairs go. You shift gears dramatically in the middle of it and it works out for the better hopefully. Uh, also, I'm not going to forget about all the work that we've done up to this point. Um, in the next episode, we're going to use all of the work we've done up to this point and uh, continue working on that stuff. So there is a dramatic shift in gears coming, but uh, rest assured, we're not just throwing away all the effort that we've put forth so far. So we'll get back to it. All right, uh, I'm, I'm next level dumb, apparently. Uh, this machine on the left is the one that we've spent the last day and a half trying to clean and still smells like rat feces. Uh, this one on the right here is the spare machine. So uh, seeing that we had a good plus five, plus 12 and minus 12 on this one, I was thinking that maybe we had a problem with the CRT cage. And the CRT is just like a little separate thing that can pull right out. So I said, you know what, I'll just hop over to the part machine and pop it out of this one. And when I opened it up, it was clean. There's no rat poop in here anywhere. I've spent the last day and a half swimming in rat excrement and I didn't need to. <laughs> All right, lesson learned check your parts machine first because it might not be the parts machine. It might be the main machine. Uh, I think what I need to do with this one is pull the cards out, make sure that everything's clean, put a little deoxid in the sockets. Uh, and then I'm just gonna try and power this one up instead because it's way cleaner and smells better so I can get the stinky one out of the room. I do need to get the CRT cage out though. The CRT has slipped loose of its anti-implosion ring and it's just kind of like floating free here. Um, so we're gonna very carefully try to get that going. Also, I think this front panel off of the uh, stinky machine is better looking so I'm gonna put that front panel on here. So uh, I'm not gonna make you guys watch that because we've already done all that once, no need to make you watch it twice. So uh, I'll catch back up with you guys <laughs> in a couple hours once this thing is totally clean and we're ready to test it. Here we go again, only with the parts machine. Pretty much everything you saw in the first half, I just did again, only with less water hose. Uh, so I have the brightness and contrast uh, potentiometers freed up and they're all the way maxed. So uh, we should see something on the screen if we're generating high voltage and the CRT is alive. Uh, other than that, I have no idea what's gonna happen. So we'll flip this switch. Uh, oof, here goes nothing. The 120 volt fan did spin up, but it's very, very slow. Whoa, <laughs> check that out. 
Oh my gosh. So we have a picture. I mean, it's nothing to write home about. And I don't think we're generating uh, any text or anything. I didn't hear a beep. So we may not have the rest of the system working, but our CRT works. That's awesome. Check this out. I was filming some B-roll and I was adjusting the uh, potentiometers here to try and get a good picture. And uh, look at that. There's a little underscore right there. So we have enough logic running to draw an underscore on there. Um, I don't know if that means that this thing is working as a terminal, but that is excellent news. That means that we have a large amount of stuff functioning correctly. I've been trying to get it to uh, show something, anything on the screen other than that little underscore. And uh, no matter what I do, I just can't get it to do anything. I even tried jumping across pin two and three. So I don't know if there is an issue with the keyboard or we have an issue deeper within. But there is one way to test, and that is with our PDP-1123 over here. Now, this is doing it at 9600 8-in-1. I can set this to 9600, but I don't know how to set it to 8-in-1. So I'm just going to cross my fingers and hope that it's at 8-in-1. If it's not, we might still see something. It might just be junk, because we're going to be sending at the right speed anyways. Uh, so let's make sure we're in 9600. We are. Let's go ahead and flip the PDP on. The cooling fans on it has spun up. Let's flip the power switch on on the Envoy here. The screen is up. I can see my little uh, underscore there. We'll flip the halt and then flip restart. My underscore went away, uh, but that's it. Nothing else showed up. Um, so, well, that might mean that my keyboard is totally fine and that we got a problem somewhere else in there. So this is gonna take a little more hunting. Well, if there's one thing we've learned today, it's uh, check both machines. If you have two machines, check both machines and work on the one that's cleaner because this thing is really, really clean inside and it mostly works. So uh, I really should have just checked both of them. I don't know why I didn't. I got excited. I couldn't help it. <laughs> But we've got this one uh, mostly working. We're almost there, but not quiet. The closest that I can get is I can get some uh, parentheses to show up on the screen, which is what it's sitting there doing right now. But I can't get anything beyond that. I've tried changing every setting that I can change. There's a little dip switch back here that allows you to select stop bits and parity and things like that. Um, also, I've changed the uh, PDP-1123 over here to go from seven bits to eight bits and things like that. And no matter what I do, I only ever get uh, parentheses out of it. But the fact that when the PDP-1123 sometimes boots, it sometimes spews parentheses onto the screen, tells me that the UART is mostly working. As a matter of fact, tells me that a lot of this is working, but a lot of it also isn't working because in full duplex, whatever we type should uh, echo back onto the screen, that doesn't happen. If I have pin two and three jumpered on the connector, we should definitely be getting echoes back on the screen. That's not happening. So we've got failures somewhere. Fortunately though, the schematics for this exist, kind of. They don't actually exist for the Envoy. They exist for the console 580, which uses the same exact cards. The Envoy is just a really, really small console 580. And so with those schematics, we should be able to troubleshoot this and get it going, which is what we're gonna do in the next episode. I'm gonna go take multiple showers because I am tired of looking at rat poo. <laughs> And so I'm going to call it here. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. The portable PDP-1123 project is uh, shaping up really excellently. I think these two are going to make a perfect pairing. And when we get into the next episode, we're going to dig in and try to get uh, communication happening between the two and using the 1123 with the ads envoy here. So thank you again so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.